Okay. Um, so, as I was saying, the focus of today is uh, the burden of foodborne diseases and uh, to give a little bit of context, um, unsafe food uh, led to uh, 600 million cases of uh, foodborne illnesses and uh, 40, uh, 420,000 deaths. And uh, this can also be expressed in a loss of 33 million years uh, of healthy life globally. Uh, healthy life years globally. Um, but the foodborne disease, uh, yeah, it's, it's a problem worldwide, but it's particularly important in low and middle income countries. Um, so yeah, this is a bit different from other diseases that we usually tackle in the global burden of disease where like cancer, cardiovascular diseases have, are more um, yeah, important for uh, the um, high income countries. Um, and today we have uh, the honor and we are very happy to have uh, two speakers from uh, the FERC, which is the Foodborne Disease Burden Epidemiology Reference Group, uh, which was created uh, in 2006 um, in the WHO's Foodborne Disease Burden Group. Um, and as the name says, has a focus on foodborne uh, diseases. Um, so the estimates for uh, 2010 um, are part are already uh, available, and they are part of what is called FERG one. Um, and uh, they are um, they gave estimates about incidence based disability adjusted life years. Um, but there is also the idea to continue this work, and in fact, uh, there is going to be a FERG two uh, that the presenters today will talk about. Okay, uh, this was all for like a short introduction. So uh, I'm going to leave the floor now to, to Sara, um, who's going to talk about uh, some methods, I believe, of an estimates of um, the FERC uh, yeah, work. So I'll stop sharing and I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. So I will start. Um sharing myself do you see my presentation yes thank you excellent so thank you vanessa for the introduction as you said i'm going to talk about how we um can deliver evidence for public health within safety food safety building on burden of foodborne disease estimates and i'll try to set the scene for for yuki's presentation afterwards and and yuki will talk more about the ferg and current efforts Let's see if I can. Yeah. So you've actually just mentioned these numbers. So uh, foodborne diseases, they cause a substantial burden of disease globally. And the WHO report that you mentioned, published in 2015, was very important to raise awareness for the importance of, of foodborne diseases uh, at the global level. So there had there there were already um, substantial efforts to control foodborne diseases in many countries globally. But here we could see the extent of the burden um, in, in countries also less developed and, and in different regions of the world. So here the, the WHO estimated that every year around one in 10 people fall ill, as you mentioned, and this leads to the loss of 33 million healthy uh, life years um, globally and around 420,000 deaths. So now we have the aware, awareness and um, more, um, more focus on the need for controlling foodborne diseases. And then our ultimate objective then will be to be able to prioritize food safety interventions. And to do this, we need to answer a few questions. First of all, what is the public health impact of different foodborne diseases? And these are the type of numbers that the WHO report prevented, presented. Uh, and building all this, we will not want to know how can we compare diseases according to their importance in different regions? What's, what's the priority um, in different locations globally? After we've prioritized the most important diseases, we will then need to know what's causing these problems. So how can we identify the most important sources and routes of transmission? And then again, prioritize our interventions on this uh, most important sources. Um, and the third step, we will then want to identify the options for interventions across the, the food chain. So the, the systems within each of these sources or transmission routes, and then ideally at the end, we will want to measure the effect of each intervention. 
But then we'll have to, to do this, we'll have to overcome a few challenges. So foodborne diseases, there are a wide range and these are caused by over 250 hazards. So there's more than 250 causes of foodborne diseases. And these include a, a wide range of bacteria, but also viruses, parasites, and, and chemicals. Other challenges are that we typically faced um, an, an underreporting problem with foodborne diseases. Although some of these diseases will be apparent, we will have say data, for example, from surveillance on the number of cases in a population. They will eventually they will um, they will always be underreported. So we're not capturing all the cases of disease. Some of the diseases are even not reported at all, and I'll go back to that. Foodborne diseases also have a wide range of health effects, and these vary in severity. So they range from mild diarrhea to severe diarrhea, but also um, neurological effects, for example, even cancer and reactive arthritis. So there's a wide range of health outcomes associated with foodborne diseases. And naturally, these also have different durations and different mortality, so case fatality. Chronic diseases are also difficult to attribute to a specific exposure. So not only they're quite unspecific and they be, can be caused by many different uh, hazards or risk factors, but they will also appear long after exposure, exposure. So it's a challenge to link this directly to the exposure to the food safety hazards. And then la lastly, there's also various sources, various routes of exposure, even for one uh, specific disease. And these sources and the importance of these sources will vary depending on the disease or the hazard, but also for different countries. So there's a number of challenges that we'll need to overcome to understand the full extent, the full public health impact of diseases. And this is where burden of foodborne disease studies come in. So they have as a goal an overall aim to rank and prioritize diseases based on, on the public health impacts that they're causing in a specific population. But we can divide these overall aim and or make it more specific in terms of objectives. So we'll have to aim to estimate the burden of disease caused by each of the foodborne hazards in terms of incidence. So the true number of cases, mortality, as well as disability adjusted life years. So the burden of disease metric that we're commonly use, using for burden of disease studies. Burden of foodborne disease studies, then they're also very useful to develop a framework that can then be used to routinely update these estimates and eventually uh, measure the, the in trends and also the effects of interventions that have been implemented in, in food safety. So I've mentioned that we, we use the DALI as the metric for burden of disease studies, and I imagine that the majority of the audience will be familiar with the metric, but if you're not, it's a metric established um, by the Global Burden of Disease Study already in, in the 90s. And it's a health gap metric that translates uh, the burden of a disease uh, in terms of incidence as well as mortality. So it integrates incidence, mortality, severity, and duration of all health outcomes caused by a specific disease into one single metric. But then, as I mentioned, another key component of global foodborne disease studies specifically is that we will need to identify the most important sources of transmission. And this is particularly important for foodborne diseases or, or uh, that have multiple sources. So here we have the illustration, the case of, of Campylobacter. So that's a bacteria that's very commonly causing foodborne diseases. Um, and what an important reservoir of this bacteria has been identified as poultry, so chicken, other poultry, but then infections can also be caused by consumption of other foods, such as dairy products, beef. It can also be caused by direct contact with live animals that may be infected themselves, as well as environmental uh, exposure. So if we want to use our burden of disease estimates to prioritize interventions, we will need to identify which of these sources and routes of transmission are the most important causes. And for this, we typically use source attribution methodologies, so that you can consider them as, a, as an add-in to burden of disease methodologies in the context of foodborne diseases. And in, in simple terms, source attribution is the partitioning of the human burden of disease to different reservoirs or sources um, and transmission routes of 
of the infection or of the hazard. We will need to go through two steps of attribution. First, a step of attribution to foods in general, so foodborne exposure, as opposed to environmental transmission, direct contact with animals and human to person, to person transmission. And then we might want to attribute to specific foods. And I will not go into detail with source attribution today. But now I'll go back to the global burden of foodborne disease estimates of 2010 at the WHO estimated to give you an idea of the type of evidence that we can get from these uh, numbers and then what we need to complement these studies. So according to this report, um, as we've mentioned before, foodborne diseases are the 31 hazards that were included in this first uh, round of the initiative led to um, around 6 million cases of foodborne illnesses and 420,000 deaths. And this led to the loss of 33 million healthy life years. But what we can see in this map is, um, is that the burden is also not distributed equally. So here we have absolute numbers for the burden, and we can immediately see that the, so the, the redder, the color, the highest, the absolute burden, uh, so the burden is highest in, in the African region and in the Southeast Asia. So this is already allowing us to identify a localized problem with foodborne diseases in some regions. When we adjust these numbers for population size, so we look into DALIS uh, by 100,000 uh, individuals in this case, then we can see that the problem is really um, more substantial in the African region. So it's evident that food safety um, efforts should be, um, should, should be improved and intensified in, in these regions. So this is one of the important outputs of these type of estimates and reports. We can also look at the ranking of foodborne diseases at the global level. And here the names are a bit small, but we can see that the, the pathogens or the hazards that are closest to the right on the X axis are the ones causing a highest burden globally. So here we have uh, non-typhoidal salmonella, uh, salmonella tifi, EPEC, tenius solium, norovirus, campylobacter, and so on. This is at the global level. But if we zoom in into the most important pathogens for the different regions, so if we revisit the graph, uh, re revisit the estimates by regions, we can see again, that burden is highest in, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and some of the regions of the Americas and, and, the, um, uh, and the Emerald region, so the Eastern Mediterranean region. But then the contribution of the different groups of pathogens and hazards is also quite different. So diarrheal disease is causing a substantial part of the burden, but then we have invasive infectious diseases important in some regions and not so much others and the same for parasites. We can also zoom in then in specific groups of diseases. In this case, we have the par parasitic diseases. And again, we can see that the most important parasites in this case also vary from different regions. So it's evident that cystis cercosis is a, an important problem in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, but then the relative importance of other um, parasites in this case varies substantial between regions. And we have, for example, in the Euro uh, Western Pacific region, some, some different colors, meaning that we have different problems in terms of agents in the region. This is very important to, to prioritize food safety interventions. I would also like to show a, a graph of estimates that were actually published subsequently. So this is in, in, in sequence of the, of the work of, of the first Berg group. Uh, focusing on chemical hazards and here we have the burden of heavy metals in the different regions and what i think it's particularly interesting in these estimates in this graph is that although we still have different differences between regions it's evident here that the burden is much more equally distributed across regions we have an exception there with, with the countries in north america but we have a high burden um, in regions across the globe and the same goes for the contribution of different chemicals in this case. So we have lead and methylmercury, for example, causing a high burden. An important consideration here is then the link to the foods that are most often causing ex or responsible for exposure to these chemical hazards. And these are widely consumed and considered healthy foods like fish and fruits and vegetables and, and grains and beans. 
Um, and again, here it's important to consider this, consider, uh, consider this for food safety interventions, how and how they can eventually become contaminated through, for example, environmental exposure globally. Also, subsequent work related to the FERC, so building on the WHO reports estimates, and, and in this uh, in this graph we see the attribution of the burden of pathogens or enteric pathogens in the different regions attributed to the specific foods, and this is to highlight that the causes of foodborne pathogens in general also vary um, substantially across regions. And again, this is going to be important to to prioritize food safety interventions also while taking into consideration the foods that are very important sources of, of nutrition in some of these regions. So that's another angle that we will need to consider. But so these are the, the global perspectives, the, the estimates that we get at the global uh, level from the WHO report. What can we do to add to these global estimates? And, and again, I'm going to link with the WHO work. Not many countries globally have had the capacity so far to estimate burden of disease at the national level. As Cal and Walter et al. Uh, a few years ago published the review of burden of illness studies, so studies that corrected for underreporting and, and underdiagnosis to estimate the true incidence. And this just to show you uh, that the, the studies focused on, on a selected range of pathogens and again also a selective number of regions and, and used very diverse methods to estimate burden, which also, of course, has some consequences for comparability of these estimates. But there's clearly a need to, to uh, an identified need to move towards or to complement burden, global burden of disease studies uh, with studies at the national level, if possible. And the WHO is also contributing to this by providing materials and raising building capacity to estimate the burden of foodborne diseases at the national level and, and published a handbook for country studies a few years ago. It's available online. Um, and in this handbook, readers are are presented with a with a suggested framework to estimate burden of foodborne disease studies that goes through all these steps and also links the work by the WHO to try to raise capacity. And this is just a snapshot. So summing up and, and also in this report, in this handbook, uh, there's the description of major, uh, the most important requirements for a burden of disease study in terms of data from surveillance data to contamination consumption, as well as literature, capacity to estimate burden, and the very important component of engage, engaging key stakeholders in throughout the process and in different steps of the process to make sure that the initiatives are, are relevant uh, and used. And then from this, of course, the ultimate aim is then to create impact um, for food safety control for control of foodborne pathogens. And there's also a suggestion on how the outputs of a burden of disease study, so the range of estimates that the study delivers, as well as the evidence of the ranking of, of pathogens or hazards and sources can be translated into outcomes in terms of the adoption of food safety strategy, as well as impacts in terms of public health uh, improvements, so reduction of the burden of, of foodborne diseases. And this is a very important milestone and goal for impact of burden of disease studies. Just to summarize, as we've mentioned, uh, as I've mentioned at the beginning, one of the most important um, objectives of burden of foodborne disease studies is to be able to provide evidence for policymaking, so pro prioritize food safety interventions, but we can also list a number of other objectives and aims and important outcomes of, of the study. And I'll leave you here just with a few ideas. I'm linking now with the global burden of foodborne disease estimates that we're expecting for soon, and uh, Yuki Minato will present the initiative afterwards. Um, and we'll just end with a summary that burden of foodborne diseases are useful to establish priorities, build capacity, improve data collection, and contribute to the global efforts to for food safety interventions. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so 
we can, uh, so if you want to put some questions in the chat, uh, Sarah will be able to answer them either directly in the chat or after um, Yuki's presentation. So I'll directly leave the floor uh, to Yuki then. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, maybe I need to swap. Uh, no, no, we see the no. The full, yeah, we see the full screen, so it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me see. Give me a second. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yuki Minato. Uh, I'm a technical officer at the WHO Department of Nutrition and Food Safety um, and sitting in the monitoring and surveillance unit for nutrition and food safety. Um, today, I will speak about uh, mainly um, our new work uh, to estimate or update the burden of foodborne diseases for 2025 publication. But I would like to perhaps stress for this particular audience who are uh, primarily uh, researchers uh, or people in academia, so that um, to highlight the importance of the data that you are all generating for our work and to connect that to uh, political you know, commitment or movements. So, um, I think I don't need to speak a lot about this as Sarah has really provided a very good base of this um, a presentation here. Just to say that um, for food safety, um, it is very complex because we are dealing with many different hazards and um, under reporting and under assortment is, is gigantic and so the whole um, vision is to try to understand exactly what is happening you know uh, below the water basically and um, for that this idea to use DALI uh, was discussed and agreed uh, upon um, the first establishment of the FERC group in 2006. Um, so this I think has been already presented by Sarah but um, based on that, also the World Bank has uh, further, you know, utilized this data to uh, economize the burden um, in a, in a financial term. And um, in their publication in 2019, uh, 110 billion US dollar uh, was estimated to be the, you know, the, the the lost productivity and medical expenses due to unsafe food. <laughs> So, um, this was a significant, let's say, milestone to publish this report in 2015. In 2019, there was one big international conference on food safety, um, convening mainly policymakers or risk managers who are dealing with food safety day to day in different you know, countries. I think this meeting was attended by about 500 or more uh, participants. Then, uh, soon after, there was another um, uh, meeting attached to the first meeting of the International Forum. Um, as you see the pictures uh, on, the, on the bottom, you see three um, director generals from WHO, FAO, and uh, back then was OIE, now is OWA. Um, um, so, uh, this really set this whole meeting and the outcome of the discussion has set the scene for um, our uh, resolution, um, which was adopted at the World Health Assembly in 2020. Um, and in that resolution, um, basically resolution meaning this is like a binding document among uh, 194 countries basically agreed to request WHO to, to do certain things, agree to do to take certain actions, and all of that is described in the resolution. And it's it's a very strong tool for us to, you know, uh, foster 
the national commitment towards you know their actions and and so on and so forth. And so, in this resolution, they requested us to uh, regularly monitor the global burden of foodborne diseases, including at the national level estimate. Then uh, it also requests us to prepare um, an updated report by 2025 with incidence, deaths, and daily metrics based on the, uh, the outcome of the first FERC iteration, um, crystallized in 2015 publication. So this was our starting point, and so we started the work towards updating this estimate and decided to keep these three metrics. Um, and in terms of, of the aggregation, it's the same, but uh, this time we're going to include national number, which was not included in the 2015 report. Um, and then this time also to improve, we would like to try to have time series starting from 2000 to um, likely around 2020 or 2021. Um, so here I, I'm going to uh, quickly go through um, some of the strategic attributes, how unique this uh, WHO estimates are compared to, let's say, other statistics that are out there. Um, so firstly, it's distinctive. Um, it's because, like I mentioned, it is bound by the the resolution, um, which really shows the commitment of the whole world on this particular area of work. Um, it is uh, regular update uh, required and also standardized methodology across the globe, which is very unique because the current uh, national estimate of the burden of foodborne diseases exists in certain countries, but uh, each country take different approaches. So obviously we will, we will not be able to compare res results across the countries, but with this uh, uh, WHO estimate, um, it will be possible. Um, through the largest expert elicitation study for source attribution, so this was also lightly mentioned by Sarah, um, and Sarah herself is the lead uh, technical, uh, the chair of the task force for source attribution. Um, this is a gigantic uh, project currently ongoing to try to, you know, interview uh, hundreds of experts in the world on a specific hazard in their knowledge to try to see, you know, the the, the proportion of foodborne uh, as opposed to other transmission routes like water or um, environment. We are also engaged governments. Um, I will perhaps elaborate a bit later on this point. Um, and then we're going to also try to ensure a methodology that will allow us to, you, you know, for anybody in the world to be able to reproduce the same results. So we're going to transparently share, if requested, um, input data or methods or code even, uh, so that it is all transparent. Um, the WHO estimate, uh, I would say, is robust um, thanks to, uh, firstly, um, you know, international uh, scientific, scientific advice body, FERC. Um, we, as the WHO Secretariat, we try to ensure that uh, the experts are uh, objective and, and impartial. Uh, also going through a rigorous uh, ethical review so that, for example, these experts are not paid by the food companies or, you know, these things are very important for uh, our processes to ensure the data will be trusted by the time when we launch them. Um, we organize these uh, experts into different uh, hazard-based uh, task forces as well as also function-based task forces to be able to sort of divide the different, you know, tasks for different discussions and really they are working very hard currently towards um, generating the next estimates. Um, the data collection process has been also rather gigantic. As you can imagine, the level of um, the amount of hazard that we need to uh, look into and so um, Again, uh, here, I'm going to quickly go through it, but basically to say um, the input data is coming from systematic reviews. Um, 
and lots of scientific collaboration with, for example, with IHME or IARC, um, OWA, uh, as well as also international coordination within the WHO. Um, and also this time we would like to engage governments uh, for, you know, potential data sharing if they have. Um, so those are the uh, the commissioned academic groups so far for the next estimate, and um, there are so many of them everywhere. Um, when I counted them, there are about uh, over 120 experts and scientists who are currently working hard to collect required data to be able to estimate uh, the next burden. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, those are the robust part and then uh, for the third point is is the comprehensiveness um, so in terms of the hazard for the next estimate compared to the 2015 report uh, those yellow parts are the ones that are newly introduced for the 2025 estimates um, this is not everything this is still let's say uh, sh still a, sh a small group of the you know much bigger pool of food, food hazard that you can you can imagine, but still uh, based on the you know existing methodology and feasibility, we we came up with this list um, and also expanded list of uh, health outcomes that will be included for the next estimates. Um, this part transparency part is super important for the WHO because at the end of the day we would like to uh, make sure that um, the, the countries will use these estimates and it's not going to be just sitting in the shelf in the WHO. So um, for that we have a rather established process um, to engage member states and now we requested all of the governments to identify their national focal point for this particular estimate and we're going to um, conduct a uh, official country consultation next year so they'll be receiving a pre pre preliminary estimate so like a draft estimate prior to the official publication so that they have you know opportunity to review to comment to feedback um, so um, this is this this I would say is one of the let's say improvement that we are making compared to, to the last uh, iteration because last time it was uh, done within the research uh, group together with WHO um, and uh, that the, the output was presented and of course it was very impactful at the same time. Uh, it was not at the national level estimate and it didn't necessarily involve government so that the, the intake was necessarily uh, it was not necessarily perfect so uh, we are we are hoping that um, this will be used much more this time um, <clears throat> and application of the estimate is also rather extensive because uh, firstly we would like to um, use the DALI to be able to estimate then the economic estimate this time together with World Bank. Um, we are already using this uh, estimate and the methods that you know to inform the strategy and we input the um, oh I cannot advance my presentation okay here uh, within the within the strategy we included this time for the first time the target uh, global target um, to reduce um, foodborne disease, uh, foodborne diarrheal diseases by 40%. It's a rather ambitious target, but um, thanks to the FERG effort, we could include this target uh, for the first time ever in the history. Um, and as Sarah has also mentioned, uh, we would like to uh, support countries who will uh, be, you know, be interested in uh, producing their own data on their own uh, to complement the WHO estimates. So um, <clears throat> key message uh, from my side is that, uh, particularly for this audience, is that um, just to remind ourselves that the result of the research level project, which was the first FERG, 
informed the policymakers and was really um, recognized at uh, various uh, high-level meetings. Um, and the WHO member states agree that the WHO will continue to monitor such estimates in the future in a, in a routine basis. To monitor continuously the estimates, um, we need to collaborate internationally. Uh, researchers play an important role throughout the estimation process and beyond. Um, data itself is a key tool for uh, motor sexual collaboration for taking um, One Health approach, particularly food safety, which deals with um, you know, different um, sectors and fields and um, you know, one language is, is really necessary and, and powerful when it comes to discussion and decision making across different ministries. Um, and the next launch is, uh, is planned in October. Um, so uh, uh, I hope that uh, you will wait for us for this uh, important news to come. Uh, huge acknowledgement, uh, thanks to uh, many, many researchers, including also Burden EU, um, Sarah and Science Sano, um, and all the other people who are listed here. Uh, I stop here. Thank you so much. If you have any question, don't hesitate to contact me or us uh, and access to our website, which has also lots of other information in there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yuki. It was uh, very interesting also to have this uh, more political perspective, uh, not only like uh, the, the scientists, but also like yeah, the engagement with uh, uh, yeah, ministries and like more uh, yeah, polit political party, political uh, organizations. Um, so I see some questions in the, um, in the chat. So now we can uh, yeah, start a bit the discussion. So if you have any questions, you can also raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, so first, I just some te uh, technicality regarding uh, the presentation uh, because Diana asked if this will be made available. So uh, after the webinar, you can go to the website of the Burden EU and there you will find both the recording and the presentations uh, of today. Um, uh, then there is another question from Engin. Um, so he's asking if we're planning to organize uh, to organize another webinar related to clinical and economic outcomes of the foodborne diseases. Um, so before going to a webinar, I wanted to ask you to Sara and Yuki, um, yeah, what is the status or like how far are, are we with the more economic outcome of foodborne diseases estimates? Yuki, I think this is yeah. probably for you. Yes, so um, the economic estimate, so we we advertised a, um, a call for experts who will inform us on the potential methodology to estimate such, you know, economic burden of foodborne diseases, and we now shortlisted those experts. We are going to uh, have a global consultation meeting in November, um, and with that, um, no, that group will, you know, inform WHO on the method, uh, and then likely we're going to have to find the actual people who will help us to do the computation, based on the hopefully by that time uh, available, um, the you know most up to date DALI, because it needs to be that would be the basis of the economic you know burden estimation. So that's the plan, and hopefully yeah. by 2026 we can hopefully. Okay. But yeah. no promise. <laughs> <laughs> so you will have to wait a bit for uh, Diana or uh, Evin who ask a question uh, for for a webinar about this estimates. I, I think. Um, and maybe I can. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I can just respond to the potential webinar on the clinical outcomes of, yes. of foodborne diseases. So these are many, and uh, and they they vary substantially by disease. So they are inherently included in the burden of disease models, estimations, and calculations. Uh, but I would think that going digging deeper into clinical outcomes would imply going more into specific diseases. So that's for sure interesting. Um, but it would have to be a bit more focused. 
Thank you. Um, so I see many questions um, in the chat. Um, so Joe is asking, can you repeat the new hazards that will be available in the next iteration? So the 2025 estimates. Uh, repeat means in this case, how uh, shall I understand the question? Yeah, so, so just to, to mention again, which are the new hazards that will be. Ah, uh, repeat. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, maybe it's better to just simply open my presentation again. Um, so let me just open that. And also maybe uh, why did you decide to include these hazards, these new hazards? Was it because some data became available or like some maybe political discussions were made uh, on, on these new hazards? Yes, uh, let me just go back first yeah, sure. to the list. Where is it? Attack. Yeah. Yeah. So this, um, it is very difficult to summarize the process because it took, I don't know, Sarah, uh, if you remember, maybe a year to finalize this discussion because it is difficult to narrow down the list to this. Um, and each addition, uh, you know, has different reasons. But for example, for the chemicals, uh, there are four um, metals that are highlighted here. And Sarah, for example, uh, presented the result of the previous FERG estimates, which included this. But WHO did not necessarily agree to officialize, of, like officially acknowledge that as a WHO numbers. So, uh, this time, we would like to make sure that the, the, the advices that are made by the FERC will be fully taken up by the data division within the WHO. And so, um, you know, this is rather, um, you know, it was easy, easy, easy addition, let's say, from our side, because it was the method was there and we just really wanted to include it this time. Um, Chagas disease was also another uh, important uh, addition, and there is a paper now published, and I'll share it with you later on. Perhaps the secretariat, if you could share it also with a wider audience, because there's a huge, you know, explanation and rationale as to why. And we also conducted the webinar on that. Um, for enteric diseases uh, as well, there was a very technical discussion. Um, and uh, of course, data availability is one, feasibility is one. The public health importance is one. So those are you know, different aspects, but really case by cases, uh, the task forces, uh, you know, recommended these addition, and we needed to also make a realistic sort of cut. There are much more other, you know, recommended hazard, but also, you know, each uh, addition means one extra systematic review that we will have to commission. There was also resource implications what we can do, we want to do, and we, we can do. So it came down to this list. Yeah, thank you. So a very thorough process also there. Um, so there are some questions regarding capacity or capacity building. Um, so there is a comment from Diana uh, that uh, is asking, uh, so you mentioned then that 57% of the countries have at least 80% capacity. Um, so, which from the European countries are missing? So, I guess the question from Diana, but she can, um, yeah, tell me if I maybe misinterpreted. Which are the European countries that don't have enough capacity? So, um, you, I think you are referring to um, the. Maybe I, I'm sorry. I should have just kept my presentation <laughs> open. Um, this comes from uh, international health regulations, uh, Black 2005, um, state party self-assessment annual reporting tool, and there is an online platform which you, you, you see the score of each WHO member states. And, and so if you go into this, to their website, you see which country has which level. And perhaps that would be the easy reference uh, to answer this question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, and also related to the capacity, uh, Ricardo is asking, uh, what would be your suggestion for a group starting a foodborne uh, disease burden of disease exercise at a national level? Um, and this was also a bit um, what I was thinking because uh, Sarah, you were mentioning some material that was created to push for national burden of disease studies. And this is even difficult in high income levels. So I can imagine that for low income level, it's, uh, it's even more difficult. So do you have some thoughts on that? About that? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, starting by answering Ricardo's uh, question, so I would think that to start a national burden of disease study, we would need some some capacity. So, some experts in burden of disease methodology themselves, but also a group uh, a group of experts that can cover the different range of diseases for which we would need data. Data is an important component, and then this all narrows down to also interest from stakeholders that would be interested in seeing the results. So the kick can start from researchers themselves, but then for results to have an impact being used and for the study to to grow, it's important to have interest and and support from important stakeholders, for example, food safety authorities or public health authorities. Um, and then, Vanessa, as you said, the WHO provided this really important resource, and it will continue providing tools and support for countries that can that are interested in doing national studies. Um, and again, acknowledging that this will not be doable for our other all countries. So the fact that the FERC is um, producing results estimates now at the national level can also be seen as a very important resource to to present national burden of foodborne disease estimates. There's, of course, many advantages to having a national study, uh, but we can look at one or the other possibility, depending on the reality of each country. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there is also a question from uh, Lindita. Uh, do we have any calculation related to the cost of the day treatment in hospital for the foodborne diseases? Maybe I can answer that. So a, a few studies, there's the, the World Bank report that was very important to putting some numbers in terms of costs linked to the, the global burden of foodborne diseases. But at the national level, there's also some, some countries, some studies that looked into the costs of illness of specific foodborne diseases. So these are largely published in the scientific literature. And then you might be able to find some um, some numbers. It will vary. The cost will vary dramatically from country to country for many reasons, including cost of health care, but also how much they're used and, and so on. But there are some countries that have estimated, including the US, the Netherlands, Denmark, and there's a few other examples. Yeah. And I guess this then will be used for the cost of illness, uh, the economic exactly. burden of the foodborne diseases. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is one question that I see in the chat from uh, Chloe. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not see hepatitis E listed for inclusion within the scope of hazards. Uh, yeah, is it the case and why is it the case? Shall I address that one? Uh, you yeah, can? Sarah, yes, please. Yeah, so the hepatitis E was for sure, is it for sure in our long list of hazards that we have to look at then establish priorities as you can mention, by balancing feasibility as well as priority. So, for example, we are including hepatitis E in the source attribution effort because we only plan to do it, let's say, every 10 years, and it's important to estimate directly. Um, and then, and then for new iterations of the FERG, it might be included for for burden if we don't see it there yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so, please, if you have any questions, you can still put it in the chat. Uh, we have still have uh, 5 minutes more or less, or you can uh, raise your hand. Um, I was, I had a question for Yuki, um, because, yeah, you talked a lot about political commitment and the commitment of uh, national governments. And I was wondering if you saw like a, a use of the, the previous estimates from 2010. Um, in like uh, political discussions, public health discussion for interventions or uh, changes in yeah, uh, public health systems. Um, yeah, so if you have any any thought on that. Yes. No, I would say uh, after the publication, almost all meetings start with the statistics, I think, um, because uh, you, you cannot 
talk about public health um, impact uh, of unsafe food without without these. And so I would say at any level of uh, meetings I, I'm seeing that I've attended, that I've observed, uh, it starts with it. So it really it was impactful. Um, but uh, within that, I picked these two uh, specific meetings that I highlighted because this was important in a way in terms of the size and engagement of the government. It was really the, the, the opportunity that connected those, you know, research results into actual political space towards agreement, uh, which was crystallized under resolution. And the resolution, we don't have resolution for food safety each year. It's, it's, it's an opportunity that we can get maybe, if we are lucky, every 10 years. <laughs> you know, depending on the size of the, uh, the you know, public health issues in the global health arena. Um, but um, so thanks to that data, I, I would say that resolution was possible. And so, um, and that resolution now set different, you know, expectation in terms of action by the various stakeholders. Uh, so those are the the key, uh, key 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 milestones that has happened. Yeah. Building upon the data that was presented. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have a question uh, from Joe. Um, so for the 2015 estimates, there was an event in RIVM to present the estimates, and uh, he's wondering if there will also be a public meeting uh, planned for the release of 2025 estimates. That is a very great suggestion, and uh, we would love to have such a meeting um, if we can. Uh, so far, we didn't plan because all the resources were put towards computational activities. <laughs> it is also a resource implication, but uh, it would be great, I think, to be able to have it. Okay, yeah, I also think so that it it's like gives a bit of impulse also to discussions for the future. Um, and then there is a, a question from Pauline, Jules came in. Uh, is uh, C. botulinum also an addition to the list of hazards? Yes, no, it, it was there before already. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions. Um, so I think we are very close to the end of the, uh, the, the webinar. Um, so I'll give a uh, few seconds more to ask any questions, but already Sarah and Yuki like asked, uh, answered a lot of questions. So I think they gave a lot of information. Um, and uh, I mean, you will find again the, the presentations and the contacts for of uh, Sarah and Yuki online. So for sure, if you would have any questions, uh, I'm sure they will be happy to, um, uh, to answer. Um, so I would like to thank you all, also the participants, for an engaging discussion um, and, uh, um, and for being here. Uh, we plan to have regular webinars from now on, so stay connected also for, um, for the next uh, um, occasions. And uh, thank you again, and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.